the presentation I have in mind today is not one to tell you how to garden, uh, you know, the basics of where you should prepare your soil and all that kind of thing. Uh, but it's one on looking at how do we get more out of our gardens and, and how do we uh, decrease the amount of work that it takes. Um, uh, some of you may be approaching uh, my age or even surpassing my age where uh, you kind of realize after a while that you used to be able to do things in the garden that are harder to do now. And I say that uh, seriously. The the uh, I remember the first time I woke up one morning sore and I couldn't remember why. <laughs> it was like, what did I do yesterday? And after thinking through the day, I realized, well, I walked around the garden and yard and after I thought about it some more, it's, well, I probably squatted down and got up about 200 times in the process. Well, that's why I woke up sore the next day. Well, we're going to come up with some ways or talk about some ways where we can make gardening more enjoyable. Uh, gardening can be uh, a good exercise. Uh, it, can, it can give us the, the connection with the outdoors and all those good things we want. I always like to say gardening is good exercise, and if you're a bad gardener, it's great exercise because you're pulling more weeds and stooping more and, and doing more work. But uh, let's talk about uh, some of these things and uh, go ahead and get started. One of the We're going to start off with more bounty. One of the tips with more bounty is to have healthy plants. Uh, gardeners allow their plants for one reason or another. It may be insects. It may be disease. It may be watering or drought. It may be a nutrient deficiency, but they allow their plants to struggle. And the goal is not to have a tomato plant that survives, but a tomato plant that produces a lot. Uh, we have a limited space in our gardens. If you're fortunate enough to have the back 40 where you can spread out and garden, that's a great thing. But in reality, uh, most of us uh, are limited in our garden space. So it makes sense that we would want to get the most that we can out of the space that we have and that gives us uh, uh, the goal of a very bountiful plant. Uh, I've known of tomato plants that produced over 50 pounds on one plant. Now, I know that's that's a lot and that's a, an exception uh, but the point is it can be done. Now I'm not suggesting we all plant one tomato plant but I'm just telling you that uh, over, over uh, all the aspects of gardening Having good, strong, healthy plants is one of the keys to having good success and bounty. There's a number of ways that we have healthy plants. I kind of alluded to them before. I'm going to get into insects and diseases and things a little bit more in a moment. Uh, but just making sure that our soil is right and that the, the plants have the best chance possible of being good and healthy. Right. Uh, adapted varieties are, are critical. Um, everybody in, well, a lot of people enjoy heirlooms and they want to plant heirlooms because there's a draw. It's like the draw that we would have to something that's natural in terms of our gardening style or the draw that we would have uh, toward a whole foods or, or other aspects like that. Uh, the problem with heirlooms is they're not heirlooms from where you live. Kentucky Wonder pole bean is called Kentucky Wonder pole bean. Brandywine tomato does great in the Midwest and along the East Coast, areas of the country that have a much longer, milder growing season uh, where it, it can take its time and then set its fruit. You plant those kinds of things uh, here and they may produce a few tomatoes and then it's too hot to set fruit. And so you use that whole space and that whole season uh, to grow just a handful of tomatoes. Uh, we do have some Texas heirlooms, but in general, a lot of the things sold as heirlooms uh, are just not, not that uh, well adapted to us. So check into that before you make the mistake uh, of planting those. Your county extension office and Aggie Horticulture website can both advise you on some of the best uh, varieties for your area. And I would suggest you start with those. Uh, another way to get more bounty is to use our vertical space better. Now this garden on the left, I wouldn't say they're using overall their space better, but they do have one thing going there and that's they've got a, a cattle panel, 16 foot cattle panel arched over the walkway. So what was a walkway now is a productive area and it still leaves the beds sunny 
to produce other things uh, beside that panel. So going vertical always makes sense. Uh, you can you can grow pretty much anything vertical that you grow horizontal. And the things that spread the most, like our melons and some of the cucurbits, uh, everything from pumpkins, watermelons, cantaloupe, muskmelon, uh, cucumbers, uh, d just all of those uh, sp spread out and cover a lot of ground. Uh, if you've got an adequate sling, you can grow a watermelon on a trellis. You just need to be able to support it. Uh, pantyhose work great for like uh, a um, muskmelon like in this picture. Uh, you can also, I've tried all kinds of things uh, for, for supporting muskmelons from sections of a t-shirt tied to the trellis to the little uh, net bags you get uh, maybe oranges or something in at the grocery store. Uh, you just figure out what works for you. But the point is, when that plant goes vertical, number one, there's less splashing of soil onto the leaves and the fruit, so somewhat of a decrease in, in disease. Also, a decrease in disease due to the fact that the leaves dry out after a rain, and so it, it doesn't stay wet as long and promote the disease development. Um, I, I will say, however, that varmints can find those things on the trellis, uh, and so just be aware that if you've got if you've got a problem with rats or other things coming in to nibble on your on your crops, that's that's still the case, even though you're hanging them up in the air. But every time we go vertical, uh, you take let's say you have a row of of cucumbers and they're going to spread out, you know, three or four feet in all directions. Uh, when you go vertical, now you have a one foot wide footprint down the row that goes up and it saves you all that extra space. So it's not just getting more bounty, but it's also being able to grow your crops in a healthier way, a better way, uh, and to to get uh, less area that you're having to take care of, which gets to the more work. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, but if I've got a weed, a square foot of garden, or deal with you know whatever I'm doing to the soil on a square foot of garden versus having to do it on let's say 16 square feet of garden space, that's the difference. Uh, another tip for more bounty is to have more crop cycles for the space. In the greenhouse industry, uh, and in even in grocery stores and places like that, they talk about turns or how many times can you put something on that shelf that sells again? So that one foot of shelf space is making you more money over the year. Well, in the garden, we have the same kind of concept when it comes to productivity. If we can get more production by uh, looking at our cropping cycles, we can get more out of that area. So that may mean some interplanting, where one crop uh, you put it in and it grows fast and is out early, like lettuce or radishes, for example. And then something that takes a little bit longer is planted also in that space and it gets to, it gets a head start. Uh, but the thing that you planted that's fast then would be harvested and moved out of the way. There's a lot of versions of that. Uh, and so just that's one technique for crop cycles. Planting at the right time uh, is another technique and finding the best time to plant in your area will save you uh, a lot in terms of uh, disappointment when uh, plants don't produce well or uh, just getting more productivity. Uh, we have we have two traffic jams in the vegetable garden, uh, and we're we were about to enter one now, and the weather took care of it for us. But if you think about, let me pick a couple of crops. I'll take broccoli and tomatoes. I've got a bed full of broccoli. And, uh, you know, we can plant broccoli. Look at the chart here. That's a uh, Harris County chart. Uh, but the same would be true up in Brazos where I am, pretty close to the same. Um, the broccoli, we can be planting it all the way, you know, into late February. Uh, but how long does it take then to produce? And when do we want to plant our tomatoes? Well, we want to plant our tomatoes, uh, you know, after the last average frost date. So depending on where you live, that could be very early March, uh, or even late February, if you're listening from the valley, uh, or it could be uh, all the way up to the end of March would still be a good time. Well, if there's broccoli in the way, how are you going to put the tomatoes in? And so that traffic jam in the garden creates kind of a problem. 
And uh, planning our garden schedule with that in mind uh, is important. Now, winter took care of a lot of this for us. Unless you did uh, some things to protect your plants, uh, most cool season gardens took a pretty big hit. Uh, and so if, um, if, if, you, if you think about these two traffic jams and plan accordingly, uh, you can get more crop cycles in more effectively. Uh, another thing that speeds up the crop cycle is transplanting. Maybe it's something that doesn't need to be transplanted, like uh, squash, for example, or cucumbers. Uh, those certainly could be direct seeded, and that would be the common way to plant them. But what if you got a four-week head start or a three-week head start on those cucurbit crops, and then when they went in the ground, that was just less time it took for them to reach maturity to speed up the crop cycle. Uh, making sure that you protect plants in the cold. Uh, the top right picture is some row cover fabric that was over some uh, greens that had gone through the winter and, and it made that garden bed bountiful all winter long just with a little bit of protection uh, where uh, something that had no protection, you know, you would have lost that, that productivity. Uh, choosing varieties that are fast to harvest, I already mentioned, but a celebrity is an old well-known tomato, but check that tag and see how, what the days to harvest is. And in most cases, go with the shorter days to harvest. If you're planting cool season peas, uh, you want something that's 60 days or less if possible. If you're planting tomatoes, you would love to have something 60 days, but I wouldn't get over about 72, maybe more days. But just remember that the longer it takes, the less productivity season you're going to have. And at the bottom is a, is a garden I had uh, when I lived over in Lockhart. And that is a, a row of hoops of PVC covered with clear plastic. And I did this uh, during this bad freeze that we had, and I was surprised at how well it did. I was telling some of the other horticulturists, some of them which are on the call today, uh, that my garden, when I put the, a single sheet of clear plastic over hoops uh, that covered about three beds and when it got to seven degrees I, I just knew you know game over there's no way that with a week of freezing and seven degrees as, as the the big whammy that it was going to survive now we got a little bit of snow on it and there was snow along the edges but it wasn't snow all the way over the top uh, to hold that soil heat in but I, when I pulled it off everything I had I counted uh, yeah, last night I was thinking about it and I counted 20 different winter crops that I had underneath that cover. And the only thing that had a little bit of burn was some parsley. And I would say maybe 10% of the leaves had a little burn on them, but the plant was healthy and it's back going full swing. So the protecting your plants here in Texas, we're fortunate that we really can grow 12 months out of the year. Uh, some crops uh, can't go through summer, but there are some that certainly, certainly can. Uh, next thing, tips for less work. What do we, what do we spend the most time and work doing? Um, Kevin, I cannot see the chat for some reason, so I'm going to ask people to just type into the chat what you, what is the most work for you? And I may have already kind of cheated here by giving you one thing, but uh, let's hear from you. What takes the most amount of work in your garden, or what do you? What is the work you least enjoy doing? And Kevin, I'm going to have to have you um, read it for me. I can do that. So, yep. um, so far, we have watering and weeding. Okay. Another weeding. Uh, okay. Protecting them from wildlife, such as birds. Oh, my. Okay. Including our beloved state bird that for some reason has it in its head that each tomato needs one peck not just eat a tomato and leave us the rest. <laughs> now, now we have uh, trying to figure out fertilization and insect control. All right. Well, I'm going to talk about some of those things. And I do want to remind you, we, we do have a horticulturist. Uh, I think uh, Michael may be with us today and Kevin as well, who are answering questions in chat. And then they can pass some of those questions on to me. And Kevin, anytime you want to interrupt with one, that's fine. Uh, very flexible today. Now Let's, we have rats. Rats? Oh my gosh. Rats. You know, I never had rats until about four years ago. And uh, they baffled me. I went out one day and my broccoli 
all the little florets were eaten off the head. I still had the head of broccoli, but it was like you shaved an eighth of an inch off the top of the head. And I stared at that thing wondering, what in the heck? And uh, it turned, you know, turns out it was rats. And uh, since then, I've more than once encountered folks that are having problems with rats. All right, well, let's talk about tips for making gardening less work. Uh, one, one thing that we deal with is weeds. Uh, no one enjoys pulling weeds. Well, I mean, I, there are times when I do. If I've had a real hectic day at work and just dealing with a lot of things, sometimes it's good to go home and just just drop to the ground and clear out a section of weeds because the, the nice thing about that is you can work for 10 minutes or an hour and at the end, you see exactly what you accomplished and it looks good and it feels good. Sometimes with work, you know, we feel like we're sweeping water across the floor. And at the end, we just, just it all right back where we started. But anyway, weeds are, are a problem. The best thing we can do for weeds is to mulch. I keep my garden mulched all the time. The only exception to a constant 12 month a year mulch in my garden is in the spring, if I'm wanting to get a really early start on tomatoes or to have some uh, cold protection, uh, I will pull the mulch back and allow the sun to hit the soil because it warms the soil faster and you get earlier growth. And I, I saw this one year when we did a side-by-side -side tomato trial where one side was mulched, the other side was bare soil. The bare soil just got off faster. And yes, the weeds are gonna come in. I'll tell you how to deal with that in a minute. Uh, but uh, that's the only time that I pull mulch back and the rest of the time I leave it to decompose. Uh, if you have a good thick mulch, you're just not going to have problems. Uh, I put in a new garden, uh, started about mm, six months, 10 months ago, somewhere in there. And uh, the only place that I have weeds in the garden is where it's not mulched. I planted some things and left space with bare dirt and you know, it was a new spot and there are weed seeds everywhere and they all pop through, but everywhere I have mulch, I don't. Now I realize nuts edge is not, that's not gonna work and, and Bermuda grass can crawl around a long time until it gets up to the top and gets air. But uh, in general, mulch is just a lifesaver and your neighbors put free leaves at their curb every year that you can pick up and stockpile. So we're never at a lack for, for mulching materials. A uh, hoeing. Uh, less work. The the hoe and the let's say the hoe that's at about seven o'clock in that circle of hoes uh, is the old hoe that I grew up with. That now that not the actual hoe, but the style. You you're that hoe is made for moving soil around. Now you can chop out a big old weed with it, but it it basically is made for moving soil, and it's a lot of work. And if you've ever used one, you probably felt it in your back after hoeing for a while. We have a lot of other good kinds of hoes. Uh, one of my favorite is at three o'clock and that's the stirrup hoe, also called a hula hoe. It, if you've ever watched uh, someone playing shuffleboard, the, you know, they're holding the handle and it's, their hands are dropped down by their side and they're just sliding their arm front and back, swinging their arm front and back. That's how that hoe is used. Uh, and it just scoots right under the surface, which is the key to less work and more effective weeding with a hoe. You don't need to turn over the soil. If you do turn over the soil, you're gonna just get more weeds and you get to do it again. But if you can slice, let's say a half inch under the surface and just slice those weeds off or slice them off right at the surface, you can remove them without bringing new seeds to the surface. And some of the hoes, uh, the one in the, uh, let's say one or two o'clock, that's a diamond hoe. There's also one with a blade that looks like a ruler called a collinear hoe. Those, the handle, you can't really see it here well, but the handle comes almost straight out. And it's almost like you're sweeping the floor. Uh, just imagine you're standing up with a broom in your hands and the way you would sweep back and forth is what you do with these. And it's just going underneath the surface. And it's a very easy motion. You're not having to fight moving soil when you do it. It slices right under the weed. The thing I like about the diamond hoe is, boy, you can do some precision hoeing with those points coming out of there. And if you get a bare soil area and some weeds come up, catch them when they're early. The longer a weed grows, the harder it is to get out. And if, if you don't wanna be hand pulling weeds 
or having to use a heavy duty hoe to literally chop them out. By that time, they're already doing some damage for your crop production uh, yields as well. Uh, but just use a use a better hoe. And I'm not recommending all the hoes in this circle. I'm, I was just in this picture showing a lot of different things. But um, look for a hoe that kind of cuts just right under the surface. Much less work, much more effective, and the results last. Uh, another weed technique, uh, th this is something we used before planting, and you can do it after planting. But if you will cover your beds with about four to six sheets thick newspaper, it can be thicker, but it doesn't need to be. Uh, and then cover the newspaper with any kind of organic mulch. Uh, in this picture, we were using old spent hay. I use leaves 99% of the time. Uh, that newspaper blocks out all the light, and except for the the immortal weed like uh, um, nutsedge, it will it will block out the weeds, and they won't come through it. Even Bermuda grass won't punch through newspaper. If you've got a hole, Bermuda grass will find it, and it'll crawl over there and climb out. Uh, you can just break it off, patch the hole with another piece of paper, and you're back in business. I'm not saying it newspaper will eradicate Bermuda from your beds but it is it is a game changer uh, when it comes to the work of weeding and if you've had to fight bermuda grass in a bed uh, you know how much work that can be this works well and all the other weeds i've also done this same technique uh, by the way in this in this series of pictures the it goes from top left top right bottom left uh, is the newspaper and we've we've uh, wet the newspaper and planted uh, sweet potatoes through it Sweet potatoes are one of those crops, the vines get out everywhere and you can have a real weedy mess. It's hard to kind of get in and work on. Uh, and so there in the, the final picture, you can see the sweet potatoes growing uh, and they'll grow that whole crop weed free. Four to six sheets thick will rot away in about a season. And they'll, depending on how wet it stays, if you keep it moist, it'll decay away faster. Uh, and then you just do it again the next time. Newspaper is uh, organic materials that are just going to decompose, typically soy-based inks and the, and the fibers, uh, and it can just go right back into the soil. And you can use any parts of the paper you want. I, I tend to go for the big sheets because that, that moves faster. It makes it a lot easier. So if you've already planted something and you've got weed seeds coming, you don't need to hoe them. Do the same thing. It's just when you get your newspaper right up to the stem of the plant, you tear the paper a little bit and, and slip it on both sides of the plant. That little slot you tear in the paper just fits on both sides. And you can weed a large bed really quickly. You just need a water hose. You can see in the picture here the water hose because as you lay the paper, you want to wet it immediately before you lay the next one so that a breeze doesn't pick it up. If, if you've got the slightest breeze, this gets very frustrating. But with a, with a hose nearby and a spray nozzle, uh, you can get it to stick and it'll hold on until you get the mulch down. I, but that's probably, if I were to have to pick one work saving thing in my garden, it's the newspaper and mulch technique, whether it's to prevent weed problems or to recapture ground early on when it's starting to get away from you. Another tip for less work uh, is in the area of pest control, that would be insects and diseases, uh, but learning what your insects look like at all stages is very helpful. Uh, if you know what a squash bug egg looks like, typically they're in little rows underneath the leaves in a little V between the veins. Not always, but you learn what they look like. There's no other pest in, or beneficial in our garden that lays eggs that look like that in that grouping. Uh, and so if you know what they look like, how much work does it take? A thumb and a forefinger squeezed together and you're done. If you don't catch them at that stage and you, that spaghetti squash has them crawling all over it, then you're buying a more uh, toxic product because these are not easy to kill. You're having to mix up a uh, spray and go out and spray the garden and uh, then clean out your sprayer and put it up, which was more work. And the difference is your knowledge and knowing what you're looking at. Uh, bottom, squash vine bore mama. Boy, can she ever spoil the show. 
when I first see those out there, I know it's game on. And you'll see them resting typically in the morning. They're, they're, they tend to rest on the leaves uh, more. They lay single eggs on the stalk, not like the squash bug that lays clusters of eggs under the leaf. The, the eggs can also be down on the vine, not always on the stalk. But learning what they look like, you can remove them. I find that it, it re it's just too much looking to get them all. They're always a few get away from me. But at least when I know what the mom looks like and I'm searching, I know when to start watching my vines uh, for the time to split them, kill that that larva, and save and save the plant. Uh, but that would be a a, a a way that we can save some work in the garden. Uh, pest yep, and disease. Yep. Yes. You have a question about squash borers. They wanted to know, do you recommend covering the squash plants to prevent squash borers? I do. Um, I used to say use the lightweight row cover fabric, and that works fine. It blocks a little bit of the light, and I found that the squash under it got kind of lanky. Uh, it, it works okay. There is a netting that you can use now, and when I say netting, I'm not talking about bird netting. I mean, I mean something so tiny an aphid couldn't crawl through it. Uh, and this this little netting uh, is lightweight, allows it, it to literally see through. And, and so I like it better. I'm gonna start using it more for this. You just have to uncover them when the first female bloom opens. Um, a lot of squash will start producing male blooms. The male blooms are on a stalk. There's no fruit on that stalk. The female blooms sit right on top of a miniature of whatever kind of fruit it is, a little miniature cucumber or miniature uh, uh, cantaloupe or miniature watermelon. Uh, we're talking about squash vine borer, miniature squash. Uh, so when you just watch and when you see that, you have two options. Number one, you can go out every day, lift the cover, do the hand pollinating and then put it back down. Or you can just say, good enough, pull the cover off. And by the time a vine borer lays an egg, and it hatches after about 10 days, usually maybe about 10 days, I believe, uh, and then does the damage, you've gotten at least a crop of sorts out of that planting. So I, I would use the cover uh, for the vine borer. Uh, we're working on some other techniques. Uh, we've got a, a, some trials we're doing in Brazos this year uh, on vine borer uh, techniques. And I can just tell you this, that I kind of feel like uh, Captain uh, the cap uh, Moby Dick, uh, Captain Ahab, you know, and the great white whale that he became obsessed with. I kind of feel that way about the vine borer. Uh, I keep trying different things, and so far we haven't found a, a really good way to to manage them. We good, Kevin? Yes, we're good. They're they're uh, making some suggestions for future presentations, but we can discuss those in our next meeting. All righty, thank you. Please You're make welcome. note of that. Uh, pest and disease management, uh, resistant varieties. Top picture is tomatoes. The ones on the left that are healthy are VFN varieties. They have VFN or more letters after the name. The ones on the right don't. Uh, that could be fusarium wilt. It could be nematodes in that sandy soil, but doesn't really matter what it is. The point is, is that if you want more bounty and less work, uh, choose varieties that don't get sick and you're not out there spraying them or fighting the problem. Um, disease management also involves how we water. I'm gonna talk about drip more in a moment, but uh, when you spray your garden every day, uh, it every time you wet the foliage, you increase the incidence of disease. And so just by getting the water off the leaves, instead putting it on the ground where the plant wants it, where it can use it, uh, is a way to cut down on some of your disease problems. I know spraying is a lot of fun. Uh, as that's one of my daughters right there. And I didn't say anything because at least I was getting my garden watered, but that's not exactly the way you want to go about watering your garden. Recognizing finally that we have beneficial insects in the garden, learning what they look like as eggs and larvae and adults and, uh, and uh, doing the kinds of things, this isn't an organic talk today, but doing the kinds of things that attract them. Uh, maybe sometime we'll come back with an organic talk and 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 look at uh, some of the ways we do that. But uh, that also makes our gardening uh, less work. Uh, so dr I mentioned drip irrigation. Uh, drip is a great way to water. It's efficient in terms of water use, 
puts the water right where it needs to be, where the plant's roots are. Uh, and if you have a drip system and a timer, you've taken a lot of work out of your gardening. Uh, th this uh, picture on the right is a particular timer uh, that can do more than one station. Uh, you can set it for different days of the week. Uh, let's see, a couple of years ago, uh, I was in a different garden and I had a little timer and it, uh, I had some buckets that I was doing in a trial of, of container grown vegetables. And for me to hand water each of those buckets every day, twice a day in, in the heat of summer, uh, would have just been, it wouldn't have happened. Uh, but with the timer, it, they got watered exactly as much as I wanted them to get watered, exactly as often as I wanted them to get watered. And I could even go on vacation and they kept getting watered. And that takes a lot of work out of gardening. Uh, so a good timer. Uh, don't be afraid to spend a little money on one. They're not that expensive for the hose-in timers, uh, but they sure do work well. And it, you can even get ones that have more than one zone. Uh, so if you did have your in-bed garden and maybe a container garden nearby or some containers nearby, you could, you could separate those out. Tips for less work. Boy, stooping and bending. This is this is a big one. And uh, especially, you know, you, I guess you get past about 40 and this starts to, you start to appreciate this more. Uh, I recently bought my current favorite tool in the garden and that's a seating bench. Mine's green, not purple, but uh, you can pick whatever color you want. But these benches fold up and you can sit on them so they go wherever you go. If you need to you know, stop and, and work on some plants or work on some soil or something, uh, do some pruning on a rose bush, whatever you want to do, you you just pop, plop down and go for it. And then if you want to kneel, you flip it over and it's a good kneeling pad. And uh, it the nice thing about it as a kneeling pad that's better than just a kneeling pad is when you flip it over, those handles make it easy to get up and down. And if you've uh, you know, if you've gotten up in the years and you're going up and down from your knees to standing, it doesn't take too many times before that that starts to, to wear and tear. And these little devices are not that expensive. And boy, they take a lot of the work and then the later uh, soreness that you're paying for it out of gardening. Uh, raised beds also take work out. Uh, I like to get my beds up you know, the bed doesn't have to be tall for the sake of the plant, unless you're just setting a bed on a parking lot and there's no soil below it. But I usually get mine about 16 inches or so high. They can go higher, uh, but two cinder blocks is 16 inches. Uh, and then that way you can set down on the sides and do your work, whether it's planting or weeding uh, or just resting a minute or whatever you're doing. Uh, it's nice to have beds that you can sit on. Lots of different options, as you can see from the photos. If you're going to use cinder blocks, I would also buy the capstone block. It's a two inch thick block, the same size as a cinder block, and you just set it on top, and then it's much more comfortable. Um, those cinder blocks are not real comfortable to sit on uh, on the tops, so I would I would use the capstone on them. Uh, Another tip for less work is in preparing our soil. Uh, soil preparation can it can be it can be one of the things we do that takes a lot more uh, time and effort in gardening. Uh, I have gardened with rototillers where I'm rattling my teeth loose, uh, trying to bang through hard soil and get get down in there. Uh, I I I like the little mini tillers, like the Mantis is just a brand example. Uh, those are nice, but even those can be some work because, you know, you're straddling, trying not to step on your row and you're you're having to push and pull on the tiller trying to get it to dig down. Uh, this year is the first year, but I've I've uh, purchased a broad fork and and you can see one in the picture. That particular broad fork has seven tines. Uh, I, I think you don't need more than four for a home garden. Four tines is wide enough. Uh, it it will do the job for you and it, it's not as expensive. Um, that particular model is, is Treadlight's model. Uh, there's a lot of broad forks for sale, but a lot of them, I just can look at the picture and see that little rod that's coming out and going into the ground thinking, I'm gonna bend that thing in a heartbeat. Uh, but trust me, you will not bend these. Uh, these are 
These are solid iron uh, welded, and you never stoop when you're using a broad fork. You stand up, you push it in the ground. You can even put both feet on it and kind of rock it back and forth. You may have done that with a spading fork before, trying to get it into hard dirt. Uh, and then you grab both handles and just lean back and just allowing your weight to pull back on it cracks the soil open. Because with a broad fork, you're not turning soil over. And this is part of no-till gardening, which is another thing that is a work saver. Uh, farmers have started using no-till for certain crops and situations. Uh, it, whenever you don't turn the soil over, uh, you number one, you're not bringing as, as many weed seeds to the surface. Uh, it's better for the soil overall. Uh, the idea that we've got to take a rototiller and pulverize soil into flour powder uh, is, not, is not good for soil structure. And with a broad fork, you're just cracking it and you're loosening it, and then you go right in uh, with your planting. And so that that's an option. You could do this with a spading fork as well. If you've got a very small garden, uh, you know, if you have an eight by 10 raised or eight by four raised bed, I, I wouldn't buy a broad fork. I would just use a spading fork on that. But I, I had a spading fork and I was using it like this and I, I broke two of them, uh, bent one, broke two. And I decided, you know what, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and spend some money and get the broad fork. And boy, I'm, I'm really enjoying it now. Uh, the no-till uh, is the idea where you don't even turn the soil over and the crop residue you just leave in place. Uh, this picture at the bottom, I had planted lettuce in that bed and when I went to harvest, this was a romaine lettuce, when I went to harvest the heads, I just used my soil knife, which is a, a cool little tool, it's definitely on my top five list of tools, uh, to just cut the lettuce off at the ground and then I planted corn right in that. And all those lettuce roots are decomposing. They've opened up chambers in the soil as the root grows through. And then it just, it, it opens the soil. It gets organic matter down into the soil because the roots are gonna decompose. And uh, then when I planted corn and the corn came out, I used the knife again to just cut off the corn. Now, this I'm talking about making less work. If you're dropping down on your hands and knees with a soil knife, that's more work. So you could use something else to, to chop those off if you want. But the point is, is that I don't, uh, the only time I use my rototiller now is in my walkways because I have leaves in the walkways that are decomposing. And so I'll run the rototiller periodically through those leaves to kind of chop them up and mix them up, maybe throw some nitrogen in there to speed that up because I'm making compost in the walkways rather than in the compost pile you make a lot more in a walkway and uh, so that's the only time I use a rototiller uh, but soil prep is another opportunity to save a little bit on our on our effort container gardening containers uh, are easy uh, you can put containers on a table and do your work there where you're sitting in a chair or standing up I have I made a table that is higher so I can stand up and do my work I prefer that uh, but you can grow some things in containers and uh, that just kind of gives you, not, I think it's pretty, but it also uh, avoids the whole need to do all the garden prep. You just buy a bag of potting soil and you're in business. The, the uh, wheelbarrow is my favorite container. Uh, this is an old rustic one I, I had. Uh, I, I now have an, I had an old one that I dropped as a plastic one. I dropped a cinder block in it and cracked the bottom. Uh, that was smart. <laughs> Uh, and uh, so I decided, you know what, that reminded me, well, now it drains well. So I just drilled a couple more holes in it and I started planting it in. I have had three different wheelbarrows that I use for gardening. Uh, number one, I think they're pretty. I mean, I, I think that winter garden is cool. It's got bok choy. It's got, uh, let's see, Siberian kale. It's got lettuce. Uh, it's got spinach and it's got broccoli all in that one bed. A wheelbarrow holds a lot of soil, so you can grow a lot of things uh, in that. And when you get your seven degree night, like we had in Bryan College Station, the wheelbarrow goes into the into the garage and it gets cold in there, but that those cool season plants all survive. That could also be a, uh, a, a summer uh, tomato planting. You know, maybe the tomatoes that are in that pot were all planted around the wheelbarrow and now they're cascading around over the sides. And, if we get a frosty night early in the season, 
Uh, they can go inside and then your tomatoes come back out during the daytime. So container gardening can be a, a real good way uh, to save. Uh, edible landscaping. If you don't want a big garden, you can include some plants in and among your landscape plants. This is a kind of over the top edible landscape. They've got some broccoli that they let go to, to flower for, um, for uh, attractive uh, blooms up there. And, and you see there's some parsley is their edging plant. Uh, there is a number of different edibles. I see some Swiss chard in there as well. Uh, but you can include vegetables in and among your other landscape plants. And the reason I say that saves work, you're still having to get down and plant them and everything, but it, it just means you're not preparing a garden spot. Uh, you're just kind of growing things where you already have a garden or a bed uh, to prepare for. One thing I didn't mention uh, that uh, I had intended to is uh, there are planters that make gardening less work. Uh, the little wheel planter that has the seed plates, you roll it down the row. If you've got a larger garden and long rows, uh, there's a, a seed plate for each type of seed that you might have, uh, the, meaning the roughly the size of the seed. For corn, there's one. For spinach and chard, that would be a different size. And uh, that allows you to plant your seed and cover the seed even without even uh, stooping to get to the ground. Uh, I've seen some some handy uh, for sale gadgets and some homemade gadgets. I know a fellow that just has a piece of PVC pipe and he just uh, stands up and drops his seeds into the top of the pipe and he's, he set the bottom down right where he wants them to go and he never stoops down. Uh, to plant uh, just by using a piece of PVC pipe. So some ingenuity can take take us a long way. Uh, the last thing I want to say is if you want to seek advice from your county extension office where you live uh, and uh, your, your county agent, uh, there may be a master gardener program in your area that can, can be of assistance as well uh, as part of that. But also Aggie Horticulture is there. Uh, Aggie Horticulture website has a ton of things. They have a thing called the Easy Gardening Series. And there is a, a sheet on every kind of vegetable you'd want to grow, uh, how to mulch, how to plan, uh, the fertilizing, disease control, and so on. And these are really cool. Uh, here it is uh, loaded up as a web page. Uh, you can see them all. They're all PDF files that you can download. So this is the one on green beans. Just to kind of give you a picture of what's out there. Um, even recommends a few varieties and things. So I would encourage you to take advantage of that um, resource and also talk with your county extension agent. They can recommend the kinds of varieties that are going to do well uh, for you. All righty. All right, we'll go out there and don't do too much work. <laughs>